that come up uh, during class here. So, today's lecture is on an issue that I believe both teams are already starting to, to grapple with, namely the issue of requirements. Like many of the topics covered within this course, one could have a whole class on the issue of requirements and uh, best practices for applying them, um, uh, how uh, the tool support for, for maintaining them, uh, clear understanding of what they are, tips and techniques for, for more reliably eliciting them, etc. We only have time for a brief subset of this material. So I'm going to hit some of the most important uh, things I see as most important, particularly for delivery of your projects, but other projects like them. So let me start by asking you, so what's a requirement? We'll talk about a requirement for software program. What do we mean? Yeah. Okay. To be successful, the system needs. And then we talk more broadly. We talk about uh, requirements elicit elicitation. What is requirements elicitation? By right. elicit requirements. Yeah. Good. So it's a uh, process, often a systematic process that attempts to discover what product is desired by somebody. You're often lucky if it's one stakeholder. Why do I say you're lucky if it's one stakeholder? What? Oh, okay. Because <laughs> um, if it's one person, they'll have a, an individual vision of what it is, whereas if there's multiple people, yeah. they might have different. That's right. So sometimes you see competing visions of products. One person wants features of type X, another person wants emphasis on features of type Y. Or one wants more functionality and is willing to wait a bit longer for it, others want uh, more simple functionality. So there's often tension between different stakeholders, and, and hence this word people here. Um, in both your cases, you have one major stakeholder. Uh, Dr. Basran's case, there's actually a, a resident who's helping her out, I think, um, will be really valuable. Um, but uh, Dr. Basran definitely is an involved sort of senior in that regard. Okay, um, so we kind of requirement is criteria, must be satisfied by a successful public. Okay, um, okay so uh, why this lecture? Well, I want to provide motivations for taking requirements seriously. Why you you don't want to just kind of deal with this as an ad hoc thing. Oh yeah, we got it. No, sort of what's on it, and just kind of let it let it slide a bit. Um, you got to take it seriously. It may be the main cause for you succeeding or failing in, in this uh, in this project. And I want to provide specific tips for succeeding in it. If you take it seriously, if you if you're earnest and you apply these tips, you're likely to be much better off. Um, so tips for eliciting requirements more reliably, lessening ambiguity, things to bear in mind to think of systematically when you're eliciting these requirements. Are we forgetting whole issues, whole types of issues that you might otherwise neglect? Secondly, I want to talk about techniques for sort of making sure that your system hasn't missed in its implementation some major requirement. So maybe if created the system, but you've overlooked some requirement. Or maybe the requirement changes and now you don't know what in your system has to change. So suddenly, you know, there's a need for things beyond multiple choice questions for the survey project. What does that impact? What what things have sort of counted on there being multiple choice questions. We're going to talk about ways to requirements tracing to identify that. So if that changes, you kind of know what things get have to be changed. What sort of things would have to be changed if a requirement changes? What, what, what's the ripple down effect, the effect of that elsewhere in the system? Where is that felt? What sort of things would, might you have to do if a requirement is changed? So suppose Dr. McConnell suddenly wants questions that involve typing in typing in some text. Yeah. 
security. Okay, security opens up a broad set of issues to security because if you're using a database, someone may paste in HTML, oh sorry, uh, SQL code and could use it to elicit information such as other information about what other people responded to the survey. What other things, what other artifacts, other pieces of what you're putting together for a system might be affected by a change like that? Yeah. Or you might have to like maybe overhaul the UI in some cases. Okay, good. You might have to redesign the UI. And at a concrete level, what would that involve? Would you be editing something? And if so, what things would you be editing? What things would you be changing? change the UI, or to change the database, to store the results of the question, or to, to change what's behind the UI. You might have to change code, right? You might have to change text, right? I mean, sorry, test. You might have to change uh, statements of the design of the system. So kind of the ripple through effects can be pretty significant. I mean, basically, you're building a system to meet these requirements. And if those requirements change, it can mean a lot of things all throughout the system have to change. Or if you didn't understand the requirements in the first place, you might have to rewrite a lot of stuff, right? Okay, so motivation-wise, why take them seriously? Well, unstable requirements, requirements that change, that evolve, or that aren't clear and never get pinned down, are number one or number two reason for, for runaway projects, projects that just never convert. In this class, we used to do readings of case studies on projects that were runaway projects. It's a great, great book, and actually this is a series of books, but one of them stands out, Runaway Projects uh, book, which sort of documents a whole bunch of cases. A lot of it is because requirements aren't, aren't pinned down or, or, or are changing over time. Secondly, you know, you need correct understanding of what, to get where you want to go, you have to know where you want to go. Um, to be successful, you need to know what you're trying to achieve before you, you know, go and actually are able to, to implement it. And finally, fixing things in requirements phase rather than down the road is, is just far, far cheaper. If you can catch things before they've been turned into code, or before they've been turned into tests, or before they've been turned into a lot of hard thinking that goes into a design or architecture, you you will spare yourself and just do a great deal for it, right? Um, and there's a lot of effort put in because of the extra effort put in because of the need to be with requirements. Um, if you go and re-implement a system that's already totally spec'd out, it's precisely specified, you just want to duplicate this system, rewrite it from scratch. It's estimated that that cost just one to two percent of the original system cost. Now, some of that is because you know basically what what the algorithms are. You have to think that through before you know, you know what APIs you'll be using, etc. But those are all derived requirements. They stem from the issue of the requirements are known, and therefore you figure out what that implies about the algorithms, implies about the APIs that are best suited, etc. So. You know, if you don't have to go and figure out what's needed and iterate with a stakeholder, you can spare yourself a lot of grief, a lot of time. And by extension, by extension, if you're going to iterate with a stakeholder, you want to do so efficiently. Mm -hmm. So that you bring down that other 99 or 98 percent. It's an amazing statistic. It, it may be less now. That was a number of years ago, but uh, it's completely striking. Um, they also have done experiments where they uh, have set up different teams, and they give them the same requirements but different team goals, and found, uh, you know, not surprisingly, those goals could be met in in light of the requirements. It turns out that that. Um, if you have the requirements all fixed, all well defined, it's a lot easier to achieve, achieve other goals. So why is why are requirements so so important? Well, they're kind of at the center of a lot of different issues within these uh, within these projects. Um, so this requirements process quality, which is up here, 
ripples through through many different particular pathways down to these things shaded in with with hash hash uh, symbols here. Product quality, development economy, deliveries. Does anyone recognize those things? Perhaps from the first day of class. That's the iron triangle. Remember? You get two out of the three, it's not too bad. Trying to get all three of these, it's difficult. Do you remember that? Remember or not? Remember. Uh, yes. Okay, so here, requirements impacts all of them. I mean, so for example, if you have four requirements process, you're, you're not really careful about eliciting what's really needed. It's not going to match what the customer wants. And their sense of the quality of the product is going to be really lower, right? Stands to reason. If you don't know what they want, if you're not clear and it's different from what they actually want, what you put in place, they're not going to be as happy, right? Turns out that it also impacts, even if you eventually kind of get around to knowing what they want, you've gone through several iterations, it's maybe required extra months of time. It lowers the development effectiveness, which means slower speed delivery, more costs, often more costs borne by the client, so they're not as happy. Um, these things affect the ability to maintain, the ability to make a server. Delete, but to eliminate faults, defects from the system early on. You thought it was a feature, it's actually a bug. Um, and, and again, it affects uh, this iron triangle. Okay? Um, and you actually end up throwing a lot of things away, and, and often that really adversely impacts speed and budget. So, requirements is. Requirements are quite centrally located in terms of their impact on these components here. We're going to come back to this issue and these sort of diagrams late in the course, a kind of systems view of things. So why do good requirements matter so much? Well, you have clear expectations, so you have better clear about what the customer wants, but also they're clear about what they're going to get. And ladies and gentlemen, one of the things you learn as you go through life is, in some cases, Setting expectations properly is most of the game. Look, you can give the same client the same thing if their expectations are different about what they're going to be getting ahead of time. They may react totally differently. In one case, they'll be delighted. In another case, they'll be disappointed. They thought they were going to get something more. Setting expectations is often a key thing. You may have a client they're clear that what you're going to be delivering is very simple functionality. Crystal clear on that, and you deliver it. They may be very happy. They think you're going to design for them the perfect system, and you deliver something that has lots of features but falls short of that full system. They may be disappointed. So setting expectations, being clear, they know what they're going to be getting. Important component of requirement. There's many other things, and I've mentioned them, and I don't want to spend time on this slide, because we want to talk about ways to help you realize the benefits of getting good requirements. But elimination of needless development, nobody wants to throw code away. First commercial product they worked on. Wow. That long ago. Um, 25 to 30 years ago. Um, uh, it was a extremely, it was a system that was used by tens of millions a common uh, word processing, spreadsheet uh, suite, etc. And I remember one of the things that struck me most about the first few months doing this sort of work was how much code would be thrown away when requirements change. And I was dealing with requirements changes, you know, every week or so. And I'd be throwing away code. I, actually, at one point, I I created a, a tombstone in my code that basically said, this is in memory of all the code that has, <laughs> has gone before um, and served valiantly in the, uh, in the development effort, but it's had to be retired and, and uh, deep sixed. Um, so, uh, you know, it, I, I felt it. As a developer, I felt it. I, I put all this effort into this code, and then I need to get rid of it. No one likes that, right? Um, no one likes to go through the design of an algorithm and only find it doesn't need really what's needed and have to throw it away. So, you know, elimination of needless development, there, there's an emotional resonance there. A lot of, a lot of Reduction project risks, 
people don't like to be on a project that's that's flailing, that's failing either. Um, actual faults are caught caught earlier, often before they get to the customer, rather than in the middle of a demo or something. You have faster development, improved maintenance, etc. Um, less chance of cancellation. Okay, so in short, you benefit the sign triangle. I talked about it. Okay, so what are some of the particular issues that cause problems in the requirement space? Well, some of them are listed up here. You have ambiguity. There's a term that means one thing to your client and another thing to you. You folks may encounter that a couple times during the semester. There's uh, different meanings of certain technical terms. And when Hassan says a certain term, it may sound like he's using a computer science term. He actually means a term as it's used in nutrition or something like that. Um, so, so, you know, ambiguity has a lot to do with it. And other thing is incompleteness. You know, they didn't spec out. Uh, Hassan is something in mind. Jenny has something in mind about what she wants. But it's, she doesn't spell it out. She just assumes, well, of course you're going to know that, right? Um, and, and you don't. You have different assumptions. You, you, you don't have the background to know that, you know, um, that, that when a phone, uh, you know, phone is supposed to remind someone to wake up, that it needs to um, play loud music or something. Maybe you'd think it just has to vibrate. I don't know. Um, but there may be certain things that, that they just don't, sp they don't um, spell out which really need to be spelled out because you're, you don't have these assumptions. You don't have this understanding. Conflict, we talked about that. Conflict between different stakeholders. Um, uh, there, may be, there may be requirements which come from very different areas of a system if you have many stakeholders which have different sort of levels of confidence or importance associated with them. So different priorities. Big and I would urge all of you to be very clear about this with your stakeholders. Which of these things we're talking about is most important for you? Particularly since you're going to be doing this in an incremental fashion. What things are you going to deliver first? And is shaped in, in significant part by what's most important. Ladies and gentlemen, what other things might shape your sense of what to do first? Hmm? Red. That is exactly right. So risks, yes. So that's, that's right. Sometimes, and this is one of the interesting things about the dance between the, the developers and the stakeholders. Stakeholders may say this is a high priority, and you think, oh, yeah, you got to do that soon. But what they may not know is what's the implications in terms of the opportunity cost? What's the implications in terms of how long it takes? What do I mean by opportunity cost, folks? This is one of these terms that just waiting to be on the exam. Yeah. Well, every second you spend doing something is a second you could spend doing something else. That's right. And so it's the value of the stuff foregone. It's, in other words, if I'm putting this feature into place now, then I'm not going to put another feature into place. And something they say is of high priority. Maybe if they knew that it upsets, that it prevents you from working in the next month on five other features that are all medium priority. They'd say, oh, well, yeah, it's important, but it's not worth that trade-off. I'd rather have those other five than this one <coughs> higher priority, right? Um, so often with the stakeholder, they don't know the implications of saying, yeah, this feature versus that feature. And you folks need to give them that feedback. You need to say, well, this, you know, I understand this is important to you, but you understand that that might crowd out other features for the next month. Are you, is that good? Or, or would you rather those other features? You need to communicate that, because that's not obvious to them. You have implicit assumptions, they have implicit assumptions. And they're different implicit assumptions. They're not going to know the technical weight of it. Uh, security, yeah, sure. Um, 
Sure, sure, put in that. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to have a free form entry field in um, security. That's something you can put in in about, about 10 minutes, right? Um, uh, you know, they, they just don't have any imp understanding of, of how much it costs. So you need to, you need to convey that. So sec uh, priority is important. It's not the only thing. Um, perceived uh, urgency on the part of the stakeholder to realize this. Sometimes they want that feature not, um, it's a high priority, yes, but they want to be able to demo it to people or, or want to be able to, to otherwise have confidence it can be done. Um, uh, sometimes some of the things in the requirement statements actually originate with the developers. A developer suggests a feature they think should be really cheap but will make the system a lot better. And you want to be careful about that because maybe the developer's on track, maybe the, on the ball with it, and they have a good sense, but maybe the stakeholder actually doesn't want this thing. Uh, observational error, you actually record the wrong, the wrong um, information from an interview or something, or recall error. You, you record the, what the client said after the fact, and you record, you misremember what they said. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that most requirements that your folks are going to have to deal with are actually not coming from the user. They're what are called derived requirements. The user isn't going to specify those. Let me give you an example of a derived requirement for both these teams, right? Um, the derived requirement might be this system shouldn't, you know, um, your system shall use less than 20% of the CPU time when it's running. Okay? Why do I say that? Why, why do you care about CPU time? Who cares? Maybe it pegs the CPU. Who cares? Why do we care about that? Particularly on mobile devices. Battery life. Battery life. Battery life. Or you could say, the, or another way to phrase the requirement, which will probably be even better, is the, you know, the battery life uh, when running this app in foreground or background shall be no less than 10 hours with the device, right? How many of these medical residents are going to want to carry this device if after 10 minutes it's out of battery? You know? It's going to be useless. It's not going to collect any meaningful information. It's not going to be able to wake them up if it's dead as a doornail. Right? So, is the stakeholder going to tell you that? Is the stakeholder going to say, you know, uh, you, you know this phone needs to be able to stay up for 18 hours uh, every day and plugged in for only six hours and still recover a full chart, um, you ready to go? No, they're probably not going to because they don't think about those things. Are they going to tell you, for example, Josh, that if you put in the, the edit fields that it needs to be secure? No, because they're not aware of the vulnerabilities. So ladies and gentlemen, there's a tremendous amount of these requirements that they are not going to tell you. They're implied by what they request and by good professional standards and what you know they probably don't want, which is someone breaking and stealing the data, but they're not directly told to you. Another thing might be how much memory it takes. You don't want your system to, to hog up the memory and start kicking out the other apps someone might be using on the phone, right? You don't want to kick out their contacts. And that's what Android does. If it gets short of memory, it says, oh, I'm running out of memory. Let me go kick things out of memory. Other things out. You don't want it to kick things out. So it should be you have a modest memory footprint. Is this on or Jenny going to tell you that? No. No. Um, you have to kind of think, oh, this is kind of implied by their requirements. Um, I think. And you might want to check that with them. You know, what sort of battery life is okay? okay. Um, so typically custom requirements lead to many more implied requirements. Most of these relate to sort of how you accomplish this thing, not just what is wanted. So sometimes it may imply it has to be an efficient algorithm. Sometimes it implies it has to be energy efficient. Um, sometimes it implies it has to be secure. But these are not things a customer is going to come up with directly. And this makes it hard. They're not going to be mentioning these in the interview. Now, along these lines, and contributing to this, we often make a distinction between functional requirements, which are how the system behaves, which are typically the sort of thing that a client will directly address. 
What does it do? What features does it have? What can you do with it? What things does it accomplish? These are functional requirements. And then there's a set of non-functional requirements that don't have to do per se with the sort of functionality of the system which are, which are needed. So let's talk about functional requirements. And the classic way of encoding these is statements like this. The patron shall be able to reorder any meal he had ordered within the previous six months, provided that all food items in that order are available to many to the meal. So, you know, th the system shall be able to compute the score for a survey um, recorded from the user uh, at the once all questions are answered, provided that all questions are answered, something like that. Right? Um, we say, uh, you know, it shall be able to do this for a certain type of user. What is it doing it to? It's computing for the survey, for example. There may be some qualifier, provided that enough memory is available, provided the phone is enough charge, provided that, uh, that all questions have been filled in. And there may be certain uh, conditions that are specified under which this happens or, or what the result is or, uh, again, a qualifier. So, you know, there's many good books, and I have some of these in my office, if people are interested in learning more about these basic types of bread and butter functional requirements. One of the key components of this are what are called use cases. How many people here have seen use cases before? What class introduced these? Is there so many? Okay, great, great. That's, uh, that's actually very good. I wasn't sure. So I don't have to talk about this, you know, about it telling a story, you know, focusing on some user goals. And often it's a good way to sort of think through common scenarios before you write down the functional requirements, right? Common stories that your system has to do, right? And it has many components. You can have preconditions, postconditions, normal and alternative flows, et cetera. And it can be understood by many users. It's a boundary often. People from all different backgrounds can understand this, right? Um, and it works really well for cases where there's significant complexity in user interaction, or that's where the action is. Um, and you can use this to consider things um, you, you could sometimes use to sort of explicitly reason about, um, about things that are alternatives that haven't been anticipated here. So sometimes you can use it as kind of an anchor to reason, hmm, what would happen if this other case occurred that's not healthy? The problem is there's some um, there's some shortcomings of these. Um, so particularly for functionality that isn't facing the user, that isn't dealing specifically with the user, it's often not too uh, clear. Um, and it often is um, not very handy for describing complex series of conditions. Under these cases do this, under these other cases do these different things, where you really want a more structured way, like a table or a tree, to specify it. Okay. But I'm not going to spend as much time um, as because you've seen that uh, previously. I want to talk some about non-functional problems. These are examples of non-functional problems. Why am I putting these up? I'm not interested in folks in you learning a taxonomy within, within requirements. There are two sorts, functional and non-functional requirements. I mean, I don't want, I'm, I'm not just talking about this so you can regurgitate that. I'm talking about this because in your projects, and projects you undertake later in your career, you may want to explicitly think about these things which are not often going to be mentioned by the user. When you're thinking about what the user told you, or ideally when you're at an interview, you can carry a list of these things and say, well, you know, um, uh, so, so the system that's being talked about, are, do other apps have to run at the same time? And is it important that those apps still remain responsive? Or is this phone we're giving out to these medical residents, is it okay if this only this app is, is functional, the others are too slow to run? Probably that's not going to be an issue because it's a fairly lightweight type of system, but performance you know, could impact the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, availability and usability of other apps. So you could ask a question like that, or footprint, memory footprint. Do other apps need to stay running when this one is running? If not, well, it's not a big deal. If this app, you know, 
it's extremely important that this app run not displacing any other applications. Well, that's something you really want to be careful about. Because maybe it's going to squeeze out others. You want to look at your phones. What sort of phones are these? How much memory do they have? Is it really an issue, et cetera. Um, platform limitations. Is it okay that this only runs on Android? Does this also have to run on an iPhone? Hassan and Jenny may they may not be too familiar with the with the phone universe and what systems are out there. Of course they well, you know, if you build it for Android, does that mean it's automatically available for iPhone? Uh, no, but they don't know that, right? They may not know that. So these are the sort of questions you can ask. You know, um, does this have to be easily easily transported to the iPhone for, in terms of uh, portability? Are there certain features about this that need to be easy to extend? Like in the future, does Hassan need these surveys to now support um, conditional factors? And if you answered this thing to the previous question, then ask this question. Does he need that in the future? If so, you might want to design your system so it has greater flexibility in that regard. So it can take a greater variety of types of questions. Reusability, security, etc. Um, these are all these are all considerations the user is probably not going to mention. And you might want to bring this list and ask. Just go through each of these, see if there's any hidden issues, right? Because there could be some gotcha there. And when you deliver it, they say, well, oh, that's great. It worked on the, on, on the uh, Android. So where's the iPhone version? What? You didn't bring an iPhone? Well, well of course we're going to be using it with iPhone. What? We didn't discuss that? You know, um, that would be an unfortunate thing. So you want to bring those things up proactively early on. Um, you don't want to be announcing this in the final demo and and have Jenny show it to a colleague and say um, um, oh this guy really wants to use it put it on his iPhone right now <laughs> uh, okay uh, so so inter some other indirect requirements uh, performance or requirements these actually can be broken down more, you know, response on how quickly does it have to sort of respond to the user. Um, uh, in terms of the throughput, how quickly does it have to go through certain tasks. In your case, these aren't going to be as big an issue, but if you're building a website, this would be, this could be quite important. Um, uh, maintainability, um, maintainability is a whole other sort of thing we'll be talking about. We'll be looking at code in this class student code, um, and there's some things here that you need to hit. I, I put a really high premium on developing a sense of quality when it comes to code, a sense of good aesthetics. What code is solid, clean, respectable, has dignity to it, and what sort of code is should be beneath your dignity to write. These things are important. The client is not going to know about this. They're not going to see it. They're not going to know if the code base is fucky or not. So we had a client last year for a team. A team run by your colleagues who are now in fourth year. A fine team of bright young men and women. And they had an extremely senior client here on campus someone with an international reputation known around the world and uh, she wanted them to build, uh, build a database and uh, she was so excited she was so excited when I hit her up with the team she said she's just fired up to work with this team just like, and you know the first couple of meetings went by and, and they were producing things and showed her a mock-up of it you know it was like initially a paper I think and then they showed her a census site and she could almost taste it, just, just there and working, and you press search, and it would search for some things. And there were some minor things that had to be, to be fixed, but it, uh, it, uh, it was really coming along. And then, ladies and gentlemen, in the final month, it all collapsed in the most hideous way. And on what basis did it collapse? On the most heinous of hairballs. 
Mm -hmm. um, the hairball in the form of the code. I saw it, I witnessed it, and I called them out on it, but it was too late. The project was beyond saving. The client was bitterly disappointed. They had almost seen to have made no progress like in the last six weeks of the term or something like that. How could that be? What she didn't see was beneath the surface. The monster lurking in the code base. She wasn't looking at the code base. She didn't see the PHP script that just cut and paste repeated the same lines 20 times in a row with minor modifications between them. She didn't see the lack of functional abstraction. She didn't see the inability to test because things were mixed together between the UI and the business logic in the most unseemly of, of mixings. She didn't see the, the horror of it. <laughs> I communicated this to the class in no uncertain terms. On this very floor, I shook in front of them. <laughs> I asked them, had they no dignity? Had they no shame to put out this sort of code that was more akin to diarrhea than, <laughs> than anything anything appropriate. Um, and yet the client was, mis was mystified. Like, what's going on here? They seemed so together and so with it. They understood and they were making progress. And then suddenly it all broke down. The client didn't ask them for clean code. I asked them for clean code. And ladies and gentlemen, they failed to deliver to their peril. And the client was bitterly disappointed. She wrote it for disappointment. I asked her if she would consider being a client for this class. I think she spoke of her disappointment. Um, and, and she decided that discretion was the better part of valor and chose not to partake. Um, so what, what led to the failing there? It was a requirement. It was an implied requirement, an indirect requirement. Ladies and gentlemen, when you write code, have dignity. Have a sense of shame. Apply good coding principles that we'll be talking about in this class. But remember, the client will not ask for that. Remember, it's up to your dig sense of dignity and shame to maintain a decent code base. They will not, they will not request it explicitly. But I'll be wrong. OK, so some tips here. Recognize requirements documents as, as useful. I, I'm not interested in having you write requirements documents just for me, okay? Um, you don't have enough time in these projects to do everything you want. And if you're putting these out just for me, you know, there's a, there's a problem. They can be really useful tools. Why can they be a useful tool? What, what could you do, besides showing it to Osgood, what could you do with a requirement document that would be useful? Yeah, go ahead. Is it communicated to testing uh, and designing uh, good size of the uh, team in order to have requirements? Darn right. Remember in projects of all different sorts that things often fail at the interface between pieces within a person's head and another person's head. Their understanding of what's going on, whether it's clients and stakeholders for requirement, elicitation, or whether it's developers, each working on a different piece, each thinking the other one's taking care of some issue that's falling through the cracks. Or between testers and developers. And this, ladies and gentlemen, has been a consistent, recurring weak point within these projects because often they have different understandings. Things aren't communicated. And especially requirements, changes are not communicated. This should be an evolving document. Why not put it on Google Docs? You can go see it. You can edit it live. You don't have to circulate it after it's edited because you're pointing to the live document. People can say the rest of it. Clarifications can be made there. The client can look at it. The stakeholder can look to make sure there's not a misunderstanding on both parties' sake. So those are great reasons. Why else have it 
Why did the stakeholder look at it? Why did the client have access to that document? Speak youths. Why, why would you have the stakeholder have access to a document that's a requirement? Because it's the client software, and I know you just need to require this document, but you know what they're planning on making. Good. Good. And so she may point out inaccuracies or errors or omissions, right? So that's great. But also, and this is key, folks, I, I tell you, I've seen companies, I've seen projects, I've seen companies fail because of this. Small startups promising in their youth, in the full blushingness of, of, of their infancy, um, fail, go down in flames, metaphorical, of course, um, uh, because of an inability to deal with requirements changes. Requirements have changed over time. And one of the big reasons requirements change is because the client forgets. This may sound hard to imagine. After all, it has such weight to you this year. major issue for you during the term. But look, it's one of many things going on for the client, right? And they may forget, oh, so what did I say? Oh, how did we finally agree on that issue? Did we agree to not do that or to do that? I remember talking with them about that issue. Did we agree to put it in? And so sometimes people's sense of what's what they have asked you for is going to change. If you have it in clear writing, that's what it is. They can go back and say, oh, okay. Okay, that's right. That's how we decided that. This one is excluded from it. Your, your folks will not be, you know, having the uh, the iPhone version ready by the end of the semester. Um, okay, you, you won't be having this connect in real time and upload the data to my status panel so I can see what every person in there, which pills they've taken. Um, that, that's for a later project. So if you have a requirements doc, and it's accessible by a stakeholder or otherwise circulated to a stakeholder, it can be very helpful to keep them clear on what they promised in the course of the semester. And over the course of three months, things can change. Okay. Extremely important. You don't want the stakeholder to be needlessly, gratuitously disappointed because they've just misremembered what you had promised. They thought you promised something more by the end of the semester and you aren't delivering them. You want them to be clear about it. Okay? Um, and if it's going to change, I would say a living document, if it's going to change, you want everyone on the team to be aware of it and to have access to that. Um, you want it to document when it changed, by what request. You want to explicitly approve it. Typically, you want probably the dev lead, the test lead, and the project manager to get together and say, are we willing to do this? Stakeholder really wants this neat alternative. They didn't think of it when they first specified things. Are. Is this okay? What are they willing to give up for that? To defer? You, know? um, you want to talk about these things. So this is a living document. Don't make it just something for Osgood. Okay? Do it something to, to shield yourself from risk. Okay, requirements traceability. Let me just say a few words about that, and I'll pop back to this. Um, to this side. Uh, hey, where, where, oh man, where'd it go? Oh gosh. Uh, did it? Okay, I'm confused why it's not here. Let me just speak about it and uh, we'll have a separate lecture on this issue of traceability. Um, the idea here for traceability is very simple, folks. You want to be able to know the relationship between different things in the project more generally and here between requirements and other things. So, which requirements, for example, lead to which design decisions and which and lead to which tests and which lead to which code. In other words, you want to be able to understand which requirements are associated with a given piece of code. Where does that code come from? Presumably it's accomplished or something. Which requirements is it is it contributing to meeting? Towards which towards meeting which requirements is it contributing? Hmm? That's what you'd like to know. This is the whole idea of traceability. And similarly, you'd like to know, you know what tests there are that are testing this requirement, right? What peer reviews occurred related to this requirement? Why would you want to know these things? Particularly like which requirement is linked to which test, or which requirement is linked to which code, or which requirement is linked to which design feature of the system, or which part of the UI. Why would you 
Why would you record that? What possible purpose could that serve to record which is associated with it? It may be true, but why why spend that time? Why invest that time? Um, so that as soon as the requirements do change, you'll know exactly where to go. Exactly. So if that requirement changes, you know what the implications of it. Or let me let me put it another way. If that requirement could change and you're discussing that with a client, you know the implications, right? So if the client says, well, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, I really, turns out I, I do want the ability to have a, um, have a condition in, in this survey. Or, uh, I do want this, this system, um, you know, for doing, um, the, the human Tamaguchi, um, uh, doll sort of thing. Uh, I'd like it to be able to, to uh, you know, simulate the interaction between drugs or something like that. Um, or I'd like you to be able to put text fields in the survey. If if the user says that, you know, sort of what things are count, uh, what things are affected, what things would need to be changed in the system. You could talk about it more maturely and decide: Is this a high enough priority for the client that? They understand the risk, they're willing to shoulder the risk, and they're willing to shoulder, ladies and gentlemen, the, the extra work that it causes, and therefore the deferment, the delay associated with other, um, with other uh, requirements, you know, putting off, meeting other people, putting in place other people. So that's one reason to have these um, things in place, so in case things change. What's another reason for having recording which tests are associated with which requirements, or which which code is associated with which requirements. What other thing could we derive a value from that? What other insights about value, even if requirements don't change? Mm. What thing would we think, wow, that's weird. Something's off. If, if we looked at a, a table, let's suppose, and this is a table I'd like you to I'd like you to Consider making, okay? I want you to consider a test matrix like this. Where up here, I'm going to put requirements. Uh, another version of this I'll talk about just putting features, aspects of the functionality system, but it could be requirements, functional requirements, sort of along this x axis, and then test down here on the y axis. Test A, a test B, a test C, a test D, and a whole lot of tests. Hopefully dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds. Of okay, what would be a problem? Suppose I filled out this table and I put an X in a given cell if the feature or requirement associated with the column is tested by the test associated with the row. Does that make sense to folks? A, call this a test matrix. Take notes on it, it's highly testable. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, where is there a problem here? So I put an X if there's a certain if the corresponding feature or corresponding requirement is tested by the test. Where is there a problem here? Yes, one feature, one requirement has no test whatsoever. So we can use this traceability, keeping track of this relationship, to identify gaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's no code written for this requirement. The user wanted the ability for the phone to accumulate data on surveys, even when it's disconnected from the cellular network or other networks. And when it's reconnected, it needs to send that data that was accumulated during that period. Maybe that's a requirement from the user. I don't know if it's not, but maybe it's a requirement. Or maybe in your case, you know, uh, when the phone's woken up after being out of battery, it's, it's woken up from, from a state and, and it comes back to life, maybe it needs to push all of the, all of the warning mess or all the alerts or whatever that would have happened during that time you know, to the user suddenly. Um, maybe that's a requirement, but maybe it hasn't, code hasn't been written to implement it, right? Maybe no tests have been done on that. Could that be? 
Yes, it could be. It could be big time. So, recognizing gaps, ladies and gentlemen, in this test matrix, this is an aspect of traceability. It's a really valuable thing. Do it. It's actually required. One of those things that people want you to make and test make. You can identify gaps. Good or not? Good. Okay. Prioritize requirements. Get a sense from the user as to which things are most urgent. Maybe that sounds obvious, but uh, you know, a lot of these meetings go on and you may forget to ask, well, what's the relative priority of this? We could only do one thing in our next three weeks. Which thing would it be? Hmm? Hmm? Well, you have to pick two things. Okay. Um, another way to do it, ladies and gentlemen, is the jelly bean method. How many people know about jelly beans? Well, I mean, about the jelly bean method. No, no, no. <laughs> not jelly beans in the generic kind of thing. So, idea here, folks, you tell a little story or you have a feature or you have some requirement, mm -hmm. in each of them you put jelly beans on it. One, two, or three jelly beans, how hard it is to implement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this thing will cost three jelly beans. This thing will take jelly beans. And you might ask the client, okay, you have five jelly beans. Which features do you want? You could get those three and the two, or you could get five of these one, one jelly bean features, which do you want? Hmm? That's one way of sort of having this negotiation go on. They, have, they know they have a fixed amount of sort of allocation. You, you, you characterize it for the different, um, uh, for the different features. Okay? So prioritization is, is key. Um, you want acceptance tests that are based around requirements. So the user requirements, the things that they said they need, you should be able to test a large number of those in acceptance tests. Ideally, you should have an acceptance test that does every, you know, um, you should have a suite of acceptance tests that systematically test all of those. They test the function of the system under this condition or that condition. So, you know, you're going to you're going to want to think about having acceptance tests which which test these. Now, you may be wondering, how would I test? Man, how would I test like? The phone going out of cellular network connection, or the phone shutting down and then being restarted. Like, how do I do a test of that? Like an automated test. You might say, oh, there's no way to have that done. Well, the fact is, if you're clever about it through test hooks. You can actually do things like that. You could basically have it so that it could kind of simulate. Okay. The app is being told it's wake up, woken up. Okay, now it does such and such. So if it does actually shut down and wake up, it does that thing. And you can, your test can get it to do that thing artificially without actually shutting it down. You can have test hooks where you say, pretend like you've just woken up from being shut down. And it will say, yes, sir. In this case, it's um, Right? You, you can do that. And you should do it. How do you think people test that their software will work in the presence of errors on the hard drive. You think they take out a hammer and go <laughs> boom, 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 and, and whack the hard drive and see if it's still working? No, they don't do that, ladies and gentlemen. What they do is they have a test hook, and it basically says, inject an error as if it's caused an error on the hard drive. And, and it will say, what? Yes, sir. And it will go off and perform that test accordingly. Um, so it will go and it will see, they'll see if it works properly. That, those are called test hooks, ladies and gentlemen, and they are key. Similarly, suppose you want to test that your app runs properly under network congestion or under a disconnected network. Are you gonna, you're not going to like shut down the router or something, right? You're going to tell it like, okay, simulate this error. Throw an exception that says, you know, disconnected network. Or that says network, or that forces a timeout, and you see if it behaves gracefully, right? That's how you do those sort of things, and that's how professional companies go about testing software to make sure it's robust under these conditions. They don't take out the sledgehammer. 
Clear enough? Test hooks, ladies and gentlemen. That's how you engage these things. We'll have a later lecture on them. Just, I'm just trying to hook them into your mind right now. Okay. Uh, so, um, you want to have acceptance tests that test various requirements, and you can do it even in those cases. Okay. Even in the cases which posit errors or what have you. Um, so you want to be systematically thinking about uh, about hidden uh, hidden requirements, and you want to think about the process. I mean, about being systematic, but talking with the user making sure you periodically check in, that they're comfortable with the requirements, the changes, and that if they request a change in requirements from one of you, maybe via email, one-on-one, -on -one, that it gets treated as a thing that needs to be discussed and decided on explicitly. It's not a one-off type of request. I remember one of my commercial jobs, this is 20 years ago now, um, I was working for a small firm, and uh, it was with our second big client, um, uh, the uh, Cal State University system in, in uh, California, 22 campuses around California, and there was one guy there who uh, got my email address and my phone number, and he started to just, you know, he called me, and he had a request, he said, we really want this, we really need this feature, and that was just, it was him on his team, he wasn't the boss, he was, you know, somewhere in the organization, but he'd say, I really, really, really want this feature. And he'd be calling me. I'm not the boss on my side. But he kept on so pestering about it that finally I just did the feature. It was a bad decision. So it should be relayed up to the project manager on our side and the corresponding person on their side negotiated, okay, how much extra is it going to cost? How soon can we do it? What's the relative priority of this? Is it just this guy who wants it or does your organization really want it? So you've got to be very careful process-wise. You don't want, as, as, as wonderful as my colleagues are, you don't want them writing to particular people and say, just do this thing, and that person just does it. You want it to be discussed as a change. Figure out, does this make sense? What's the opportunity cost? Will this cause problems with any other parts of the system you may not be familiar with, but other people might be? So you, you want to be careful about that process. If a, if a change is requested, have an explicit meeting to discuss it. Change control board is how we commonly call it. And again, I would suggest project manager, test lead, dev lead at least. Okay? Um, right. Uh, so requirements uh, change process. And use requirements to guide tests. Okay, time is um, running uh, thin here. Let's talk about some major sources of, of errors here. Um, missed ambiguity. Um, so, an interviewer may have jumped to a conclusion, um, but they didn't realize they made an assumption about the problem. Can I make a suggestion, folks? If you're going to go talk to a doctor, or are you going to go talk to a doctor, um, these folks are tight schedules, uh, and it may require a little bit of, um, of extra patience, but I would strongly suggest, for the balance of term, you try to bring at least two people. Why? Why two people? That's, that's one good reason. Another reason is you may understand it one way, someone else understands it another. So just on a phone call yesterday with a potential investor with a startup that I work with, and, uh, and you know, he was saying one thing, and one of, my client, one of my colleagues was just understanding it a very different way. And I, I thought actually you know, there's a misunderstanding here. We've got two people to pick it up much more readily than one. Okay? You're much more likely to catch that that ambiguity. Those two people who got it, they said, oh, well, that isn't what I understood. Um, and they can bring it back to the client and say, well, could you clarify which of these was what you meant, if either. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing to do, okay? Um, missing requirement. Sometimes the user doesn't mention a requirement at all. And what's particularly tricky here, what's notorious about it, nefarious about it, is the fact that it can mean very different things if they don't mention it. One thing is it can mean they don't care about it. And they another thing it could mean is they just didn't think of it. They might care about it if they did think of it, but they just didn't have to think of it. 
Another possibility is that they assume that of course you know this, right? I mean, they're surrounded by people all day in their discipline, by docs all day, by, by other people in pharmacy, nutrition, other health scientists all day. Well, of course you're going to know what this word means, or of course you understand this issue. And, and it may be very important to them. It may be foundational. It may be essential. But they just don't think they have to mention it. So you have to be very careful. If they don't mention something, you might want to be very proactive and ask, you know, you, you know if they didn't mention this, is, is this an issue? How would they handle this, et cetera? So you want to be thinking about this. Missing one, you just can't blithely assume, oh, it's unimportant. Okay, um, some may miss your statement, observational or recall, or some may, may not write it down until later and they make a mistake in their memory. This happens all the time. So you can, you can misunderstand it when you heard it, or you could write it down later and you misremembered, you know, what, what actually was agreed to or what happened. Okay? Um, now those sorts of errors, you know, you just forget non-functional requirements particularly. Operability, scalability, maintainability, security, performance. These sort of things. We talked about them as non-functional requirements. They're very, very important. Okay. Oh, this is actually really important. Very, ah, you folks, this is one of the things which is most, it's very easy for student projects to overlook, and indeed many other projects. Different types of users. Often when you're thinking about someone who's commissioning this, the stakeholder, they're thinking about it from the perspective of the common user. They're thinking about it from the perspective of the medical student. But think about it from the perspective, perhaps, of the uh, interviewer or the service. But you've got to be asking: Are there are there special administrators who have extra privileges, who have extra responsibilities, or extra levels of access to these things? What's the administrative access uh, uh, interface like? For example, to maybe they want to change it so the pill. If you take the water pill, you're woken at one time versus another time, you know, after or something. Um, if maybe there needs to be an interface for the clients themselves, and maybe they forget to specify that. Or the data that's collected on the phone, how's that going to get off of there? How is it going to get to the person? What, what sort of way are they going to interface to it? Um, these things need to be brought to the fore. It's not for every user, but it needs to be talked about explicitly or you may find yourself with a big gap in, in what they actually, in, in delivering value to them. Mm -hmm. Delivering value to the client. Okay, so requirements here often lead to acceptance testing. These other components, which are often derived from requirements, you know, lead to these various other, other sorts of testing. I talked about, you know, this, this issue with a change control board, the, where, the, uh, you know, where the client may request a change, it's analyzed and clarified by a change control board. Here it might be the dev lead, test lead, and, and project manager or others as you decide fit. And then basically um, they put out candidate requirements if they approve it and the, the client may reject it. They may say, oh, it's not worth it to me. You mean it's going to take two months to implement this thing? Forget about it. Um, two months to add a text field to my survey? you got to be joking. There's no way it's worth that. Um, or they may accept it and take the hit, um, you know, pay, pay the extra cost or what have you. The important thing is that this be an explicit process, folks, that it not be just decided by one developer on the whim of the moment or to stop that guy from calling him. Um, okay. Um, I think I'll skip over um, these, uh, these components. Okay. This is, a, this is a really useful tip. Um, we're running out of time here, but um, this will be one of the last points. When you're talking with the stakeholder and ask them about the part, whether it's one person or two people or, multi or people beyond that, you might ask them to restate what they've just said, to rephrase, to re-paraphrase it. Or you may paraphrase it yourself and say, is that what you meant? Mm -hmm. So you say, let, let, me, let me tell you what I thought I heard from you, and you can tell me if I'm on base. You know, is, that, is that what you meant? Did I get it right? Um, uh, 
am I missing something? This is one of the most valuable things you can do because it checks that, that round trip connection. Okay, means I heard you right and I'm saying it back and you're confirming. Um, and, um, and this can be useful even if it's just the person who you're listening from restating it, sometimes it can be useful because people's compression changes. Maybe they put a somewhat different emphasis to choose different words, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, strongly encourage you to sort of restate what, what they've uh, mentioned. Um, okay, um, and I, I provided some examples of sort of requirement specifications here. Um, requirement specifications are generally written not at the level, so yeah, one of the more important documents you'll encounter in the professional world is what's called MSR, so system requirement specification. And it's typical that, very common that this is written at a level that does involve specific UI assumptions, UI elements. So for example, a user indicates search from places needed. You notice they don't say press is control at. They don't say press is the button for it. They just say it indicates that it's required. System, the software responds by prompting for a search term and replacement test. It doesn't say a dialogue pops up. It doesn't say a panel opens. It just says, you know, it responds by prompting for this user enter text. Indicates software to do a case sensitive search. It doesn't say if there's a checkbox or what uh, to replace all occurrences. Um, and this was, this was to sort of elaborate this feature goal which was broadly, search results will be easy for most users to read quickly. Okay. Um, and you notice they label it with a priority, and, and they talk about what's, what they're trying to achieve with this. This basically describes the, the story of what happened. That it's eliciting this information. But it doesn't get involved in, you know, they press the button, label, whatever, or this, this dialogue box pops up, or they click the X the X button or what have you. It, um, it stays at some higher level. Um, don't get so caught up in documenting everything to this uh, level. The main thing I want to prevent is requirements tripping your teams up for the reasons we talked about. Particularly client misunderstanding, particularly misunderstanding within your team, and issues of changing requirements. Okay? So you can document things even at a very, very high level um, that, that says what they'll be getting. And if you explore those non-functional requirements, they won't talk about. And ladies and gentlemen, if you maintain your dignity and you maintain your sense of shame when writing code, I think you'll be in pretty good shape, okay? So those are some comments and requirements. Uh, this afternoon, 4 p.m., Dylan will be here. He will be here with a wealth of expertise on Android development. He's here to help both teams. If the team that's meeting remotely wants to come, wants to meet with him, they can come and, and say, okay, we're meeting in Sphinx, whatever. Could you come over when you're done here or why not? Okay? That's it for today. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen.